Church Online. My name is Megan Lemons. If, if we haven't met yet, I'm the pastor of Home Communities and Rooted at our Willamette Camp campus. And just a shameless plug here, all of our campuses have amazing things happening this summer for you to be a part of, from hikes to concerts to movie nights. We've got all kinds of ways for you to get connected with other people. So we would love for you to check that out on our website to find out more. Uh, but truly, I'm excited to be teaching today and be here. We are in the midst of a series called After God's Own Heart, looking at the life of King David. And if I can be honest and real with you for a second, I actually really struggle with the character of David. Growing up, he's painted as this like amazing hero of the faith. He's a man after God's own heart. But as we look closer at David's story, we'll find that he's not necessarily the hero that he's painted out to be. David had several moral failures that resulted in, in people close to him dying, as was the case in the story of David with Bathsheba. Uh, his family begins to turn on each other. Entire nations are at war. And so why is David looked at as this great hero of the faith? Well, truly, the hero in David's story isn't David. It's God. David's story is really a story about a God who is faithful, a God who keeps his promises, a God who is full of grace, a God who is merciful, who despite our shortcomings and failures lets us know that it's never too late for us and we're never too far beyond God's ability to forgive us and transform and restore our lives. And so in this series, we're looking at the life of David to learn about the love of God and the things God loves. We find David's story in the book of 1 and 2 Samuel. David's story is kind of couched in this book that tells the story about God's faithfulness and God's interaction with his people and telling the story about three people. One was Samuel, and Samuel was a prophet. Prophets were folks who spoke on behalf of God. It also tells the story of King Saul, and Saul was the first king of the people of Israel. See, before Saul, the people of Israel were governed by God through judges and prophets who spoke for God as God invited the people into faithfully following him. But the people began to notice that other people groups around them were governed by kings, and they wanted to be just like everybody else, which came at their own peril, but that's a sermon for another day. But, but they wanted to be like everybody else. So God gave the people what they wanted and placed Saul on the throne. But here's the thing. Saul was a guy who, who had the appearance of being a good king, but he didn't have the character of a good king. And he ultimately wasn't faithful to following the ways of God. So the story goes in 1 Samuel that God wanted to appoint a new king. And this is where the story of David begins. Today, we're going to look at the life of King David before he was a king to see how God loves stewardship. See, stewardship is this idea that we have a responsibility to use wisely all of the things that God has given us. That, that would include our, our gifts and our abilities and our resources, essentially our whole life. And so today, we'll be looking at how David was faithful in stewarding ordinary things and how God used that to prepare him for the big things that God had for his life. But look, before David was king, before the David and Bathsheba story, before he was like a double agent in war, before he was on the run from Saul, before he brought unity to Israel, before all of his accomplishments and all of the big stories, David was a shepherd. He had a normal, no-frills job. David was in kind of the background of the story. He was the youngest of nine brothers. He was forgotten for promotions. He was overlooked and underestimated with his abilities. He was a servant and worked a random job in the king's court. And all of this was happening while God had a huge call on David's life. God had major plans and purposes for David's life, like eventually becoming king. And yet when you look early on at his story, it looks like nothing's happening, or it looks like a lot of very small things are happening. And if we look closer at all of these seemingly small things, we'll see a God who was faithful to come through on his promises. 
and a man who, who stewarded each opportunity that God placed in front of him, sometimes well and, and sometimes not so well. So, so let's start out by looking at 1 Samuel 16. This tells the story of David being anointed as king. So here's the scene. Saul, who was currently king, isn't following God. So God decided that he needs to find a new king. He says to the prophet Samuel, we need someone to lead Israel who's, who's faithfully following my instruction. So God instructs Samuel to go to Bethlehem and find and anoint a new king from the family of a guy named Jesse. And so Samuel's like, look, Lord, this is all well and good, but, but if I openly leave and go on the search for a new king and the current king finds out, he's not gonna be chill with this whole new king thing and he for sure is going to kill me. And so God instructs Samuel to go to Bethlehem to offer a sacrifice. Offering a sacrifice was something that was a normal task for a prophet to do. So it wouldn't have brought a lot of attention on Samuel while he's looking for a new king. So he tells him to do this and invite Jesse and his sons to be at the sacrifice. And there God will show him who the new king's gonna be. So fast forward several verses, and this is exactly what Samuel does. At first, people are kind of worried that the prophet is in town because typically a prophet coming into town wouldn't have brought good news. But Samuel assures the people that he comes in peace and he moves toward to meet the sons of Jesse to find the next king. Now listen, in my mind, I'm imagining this moment where Samuel is in front of the sons of Jesse looking for a king in terms of like a reality game show. I'm imagining instead of like the bachelor, right? I'm imagining the king. Instead of American Idol, it's Israel's king. So you have all of these dudes lined up that Samuel is assessing to be king. And in 1 Samuel 16, 6, it says this, when they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. So he looks at Eliab and is like, for sure this is the dude. Apparently, Eliab looks like a king, right? He was tall, he was strong, he was probably the firstborn. And so it would make sense that he is the guy. He's depicted here as Idris Alba, who was voted the best looking man alive in 2019 and apparently has a show called King of Speed, so it works, right? But, but Eliab, he had the resume, right? He had the look, he had the height, he was the firstborn. But God takes one look at him and says, no. We see in verse seven, this is what God says. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so Samuel goes down the list of bachelor American Idol-esque search for Israel's next king. He goes on to the next son and the next son and the next son of Jesse. He goes through eight sons of Jesse and God keeps saying, no, not the one. You don't get the rose. You don't get invited to the next round. And finally, there are no sons left. Let's pick up in verse 11 to read what happens next. It says this, then Samuel asked, are these all the sons you have? They're, they're still the youngest son, Jesse replied, but, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and goats. Send for him at once, Samuel says. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. So David stood there among his brothers. Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with, with the oil. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. David becomes king here and he's chosen by God. But before that, he's almost forgotten. Samuel asked for all of the sons to join him at the sacrifice so that he could discern who the next king would be. But the crazy part is, is that Jesse doesn't even think to invite David, his own son. David's responsibilities meant that he wasn't invited to Samuel's visit. That was until God called for him. Now, we don't know if David knew about the visit or not. 
But what we do know is that while everyone else was going to see the prophet, while all of his siblings were included, David stayed behind. He didn't sneak along. He didn't try to push himself forward. He kept about his business. He kept his hand to the work that God had placed in front of him. And in this season of David's life, David is a shepherd. That's the work that God had placed in his hand. He's faithful to doing that work, and God was faithful to call David forward even when those around him forgot about him. Even when we feel forgotten, or even when we're actually forgotten, as was the case with David, God sees us. God knows us. God will be faithful towards us and call us towards his plans and his purposes for our life. The story ends semi-abruptly without a lot of fanfare. See, at the end of American Idol, folks get a record deal, they're doing press tours, they're on the Today Show, they're doing interviews, they're at the studio recording music, maybe they're putting together a tour. At the end of A Bachelor, there's a wedding for crying out loud. But here in the story, it tells us that David is anointed as king, the presence of God is with him, and then Samuel leaves. Nothing happens. David is, is promised to be king, And then if we look ahead and we do the math, he doesn't become king for another 15 years. What? That's crazy. But what David's story teaches us is this, that that even in times when you feel forgotten and overlooked, God still sees us and has a plan for our life. David stays as a faithful steward to the job that God had called him to do, which was a shepherd. He stays stewarding the work that God had placed in his hand. And he continues to steward what is in his hands in every season for the next 15 years before he becomes king. I'm wondering if you've ever been in this situation before. You know what you're capable of. It seems like every opportunity that you're going for just isn't happening. Or or have you been there where you're working a random job, not really sure of why you're there, of what you're doing, or how God is going to use that for his plans and purposes for your life? I I know I've been there. Right after college, I was so excited to go work in full-time ministry. And it seemed like all of my friends around me, my friends, my roommates, my classmates, they were getting all these amazing jobs to work for nonprofits and churches and have impact on their communities. But I wasn't. (laughs) I wound up working a random job at the university that I graduated from for five more years. And some days of those five years were awesome. Honestly, I made some lifelong friends. I learned new skills, I developed other ones. But if I'm honest, some days were awful. A lot of days were awful. Some days my mind would kind of spiral into these thoughts of like, what am I doing here? Is this a waste of my time? Why, God, why are you not doing what I want you to do? God, do you even have a plan for my life? God, hi, it's me, Megan. Do you see me? Do you remember me? Those days were tough. And it's a long story as to how God worked and moved from there. But what I look back on and I can say with confidence is that even in a season that I felt was random and felt like it didn't have anything to do with what I wanted to be doing or see how God was developing and preparing me, I can see how God was faithful. See, there were times when I stewarded what was in my hand well And there were times, honestly, when I didn't. Times when I just felt like days, weeks, months would go by and I was lacking in purpose. So when I look back on a season of my own story, I don't always see my own great stewardship, but I do see how God was faithful and how God stewarded the time in my life to prepare me for the next season. And so if you find yourself today looking at the season you're in and feeling listless, feeling underestimated by people, 
feeling even forgotten by God. Here's a couple of questions that I want you to consider today. Look back on your life at the things that God has promised you and think, how long did it take for you to receive that promise? Has there been a time in your life when you felt maybe forgotten by others, but you remember that you were remembered by God and he came through? I want you to ask these questions and use the answer to these questions really to increase your faith, not in your abilities or your own humility or your own stewardship, but to, but, but to use them to increase your faith in a God who sees you and a God who loves you and a God who has not forgotten you. You may be in a season right now of, of waiting, waiting for, for promises and the faithfulness of God. You may be in a season right now of disappointment. There were things in your life that, that haven't happened like you thought. You know, God still sees you. God still knows you. God still is with you. He still has good plans and purposes for your life. He gave you those gifts and abilities so he knows how to steward them. Even when our plans aren't what we thought they would be, you are never too insignificant to be seen by God. The, the story of David continues in a really kind of odd way because, like I said, David doesn't become king yet. He doesn't become king for another 15 years. The story jumps next to a new scene. As the Spirit of the Lord is with David, the Spirit of the Lord leaves Saul and he becomes tormented. The Bible tells us that some of Saul's servants notice that he's being tormented and suggest that they find a musician who will help play some soothing tunes to calm him down. And so King Saul agrees, and who do the servants suggest? None other than a son of Jesse. One of Jesse's sons is actually a great musician, they say. They tell him that, that, that he plays music, that he's a brave warrior, that he's got good judgment, and that the Lord is with him. And who do you think the son of Jesse is? Da, 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 da. It's none other than David. 1 Samuel 16, 19 and 20 says this. It says, so Saul sent messengers to David to say, send me your son David, the shepherd. Jesse responded by sending David to Saul along with a young goat, a donkey loaded with bread and a wineskin full of wine. This is so interesting. Saul knows David as a shepherd. His servants know David as a warrior with good judgment, a man who has the Lord with him. His reputation precedes him. David has been faithful to steward the season of life that he is in. And by the goodness of God, his reputation goes before him. He's faithful in his work that's often overlooked and forgotten. Yet somehow, by God's faithful stewardship and care for David's life, David is noticed. And because of that, it continues in verse 21 and says this. So David went to Saul and began serving him. Saul loved David very much, and David became his armor bearer. Then Saul sent word to Jesse asking, please let David remain in my service, for I am very pleased with him. And wherever the tormenting spirit from God troubled Saul, David would play the harp. Then Saul would feel better and the tormenting spirit would go away. So now we find David and he's bivocational. He's serving in Saul's court as an armor bearer and musician, and he's still a shepherd taking care of his family's flock. Oh, and let's not forget, he's still the future anointed king of Israel. This is wild. How do we know that he's still a shepherd? Well, well, in the next chapter, it tells us the story of David and Goliath. And you know, this is probably one of the most famous Bible stories. Everyone loves a good underdog story. And we've actually talked about this story before in this series already. But what's so cool about scripture is that these stories, they're like multifaceted diamonds. When we, when we hold them up and we look at them, we see different sides and different emphases. So let's set the scene here. Israel is at war with the Philistines, and they're essentially at a standoff. Israel's army is on one hill, and the Philistine army is on the other hill, and there's a valley between them. The moment is tense. There's angst in the air, and in walks the story's villain, Goliath. 
And 1 Samuel 17, 4 through 7 says this. It says, Then Goliath, a Philistine, champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet, and his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armor, and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and as thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. His armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a shield. The warrior steps on the scene. He's huge, he's tall, he's got the right gear, he's suited up, and he's shouting threats and challenges. He says to the Israelite army, come out, send your best man out to fight me. And if he kills me, then the Philistines will be your servants. But if I kill him, the Israelites will be servants of the Philistine. He's screaming and shouting and challenging. And when King Saul and his armies heard this charge, when they heard this challenge, a great courage rose up in them. They would be servants of no one. No one was going to come and challenge God's people. I'm just kidding. That's not what happened. What actually happened was when they heard and they saw Goliath, they were terrified. But now the scripture cuts our scene back to David and his family. His father, Jesse, who we met earlier in the story, is now much older. His brothers are a part of Saul's army. And David, well, Scripture tells us about David in verses 14 and 15. It says, David was the youngest son. David's three oldest brothers stayed with Saul's army, but David went back and forth so he could help his father with the sheep in Bethlehem. David, future king, already promised by God to be king, already known by Saul and the current king, already having an inn at the king's court, is at home, tending to his sheep, taking care of his family, waiting, waiting for God to come through on his promises, yet still staying faithful to the tasks that God has placed in his hand. And Goliath is still there on the hill challenging the Israelite army. His taunting goes on for 40 days, 40 days of being challenged. And one day, while David is tending to his family's flock, Jesse asked David to go to the battlefield, not to fight, not to engage, but he tells him to deliver lunch to his brother. Get this for a second the already anointed king of Israel, is working a forgotten job as a shepherd, delivering lunch to his brothers, the war heroes. Again, this is wild. But but David does what his, his father instructs. He's obedient to the task in front of him and goes to the battlefield to deliver lunch to his brothers. Let's read what happens from there, starting in verse 20. It says this. So David left the sheep with another shepherd, and set out early the next morning with the gifts as Jesse had directed him. He arrived at the camp just as the Israelite army was leaving for the battlefield with shouts and battle cries. Soon, the Israelite and Philistine forces stood facing each other, army against army. David left his things with the keeper of supplies and hurried out to the ranks to greet his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out from the Philistine ranks. When David heard him shout his usual taunt to the army of Israel, as soon as the Israelites' armies saw him, they began to run away in fright. Have you seen the giant, the men asked? He comes out each day to defy Israel. The king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. He will give that man one of his daughters for a wife, and the man's entire family will be exempt from taxes. David asked the soldiers standing nearby, what will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine anyways that he's allowed to defy the armies of the living God? And these men gave David the same reply. They said, yes, that is the reward for killing him. David's obedience to deliver lunch lands him right where God wanted him to be. 
as the story goes, David does indeed take on Goliath and defeat him. But he was just there to bring lunch. David's obedience here teaches us something. It teaches us this. Our obedience to what God calls us to in the present, it makes way for new things he is calling us towards in the future. The only reason that David is at the battlefield is because he was bringing his brother's lunch. He was running a small errand. He was doing something that maybe at the moment felt insignificant. It might have felt beneath him. At a minimum, it wasn't glamorous. But, but while David was being a good steward of the task that he had in his hand, in something ordinary, God used him for something bigger than himself as he trusted in God to accomplish something in him and through him. And so the question that I have for you today is what ordinary thing is God calling you to be obedient to him in? What ordinary thing is God calling you to be obedient to him in? What small thing is God prompting you toward? What obedience in the seemingly small things can make way for God to use you in larger ways, teaching us that there are truly no small things, that nothing is wasted, but that every moment can be given to God. Every moment can be stewarded in obedience towards him. But, but let's continue with the narrative because there's more for us to see. You see, David's obedience to deliver lunch lands him right where God wanted him to be. And David, he begins to get curious and courage rises up in him. He's probably thinking, oh my goodness, after all this time, after all this time of being a faithful shepherd, after all of this time of stewarding what God has placed in front of me, after all of this time, this is going to be my moment. And what happens here? What happens here is that David is reminded by his brother of who he is. In verse 28, it says this, but when David's oldest brother, Eliab, heard David talking to the men, he was angry. What are you doing around here anyway, he demanded. What about those few little sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I know about your pride and your deceit. You just want to see battle. His brother is like, bro, go watch your cute little sheep. What in the world are you doing here? Why are you asking outlandish questions? Go back to your field and pet your little lambs. David continues to be underestimated. He continues to be overlooked. Maybe you're listening to this and, and you're leaning in and, and you're kind of relating. You feel overlooked right now because of the season of life you're in. You're feeling like you have the ability, like you don't have the ability or the capacity to do all of the things that you feel like God is calling you towards or you feel overlooked at work, unseen, or you feel like you're in a family where you're overlooked by siblings and their accomplishments. But God sees you. God placed those gifts and abilities in you. He knows you. He is preparing for you. You have a place in the story, the larger story, that God is unfolding in the world. And so don't shrink back. Lean towards God. Lean towards his faithful stewardship in your life. As the story goes, David's brother's words don't take hold. Feelings of inadequacy don't take root or cause him to shrink back. But something wild happens. David knows that because he has been faithful to the small things that God has placed in his hands, in this case, being a shepherd, he knows that he's ready for the opportunity that's in front of him. He trusts in God and how God has been preparing him. When David is overlooked, when David is being made to feel unseen or berated, he remains steady. Why? Because his security is in a God who, who has been preparing him. His security is in a God who has been faithful to steward his life. Here's what scripture tells us that David says. He says, don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. <laughs> 
Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he says. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Everyone, everyone underestimated and overlooked David, his brothers, his father, but not God. God saw David and anointed him as king. And then David waited. He waited for 15 years before he became king. He waited until the king invited him into his palace to play music. He waited while his brothers went off to war to make names for themselves. He waited. But listen, while David was waiting, God was working. God was preparing David by using something that was already in David's life. God was doing a work in David that prepared him for this moment, and David stewarded the opportunities placed in his hands, opportunities that seemed small, like being a shepherd for his family's flock, actually prepared him for this moment. We might think of a shepherd as someone who is small and sweet and just walks around with fluffy little lamps. Maybe you think about a shepherd and you see this image, right? This sweet shepherd man and his cute little lamb while he looks out in the flower fields with the sun shining on his face and he's just so precious. But David paints and tells us a much more realistic picture of what a shepherd in biblical times looked like. He paints a picture and says, look, taking care of sheep is nothing to make light of. He says, I take care of them and I fight bears and lions with his hands and a club. You guys, with his hands. And he says, and I quote, when a bear or a lion comes for these sweet little lambs of mine, I catch it by the mouth and I use my other hand to kill it with a club. You guys, being a shepherd is not a game. <laughs> but it did prepare David for this moment. As I've mentioned, David, he does go on to defeat Goliath. But listen, David's story teaches us that, that God prepares us for the things ahead through our faithfulness and stewardship to what he has in our hands in this season. David was, again, the already anointed king, but he was also a shepherd, an unglamorous job. But God used that to prepare him for something great. And so my question to you now is, what has God placed in your hand? What work, what relationships, what opportunities, what skills, what abilities, what has God placed in your hand in this season of your life today? Hey, maybe it's being a student. Then steward this season of education well. Lean in, learn much, be present. Maybe it's a season of being a parent. Lean in, love well, be present with your kids. Maybe it's a season of a job you don't like. Ask the Holy Spirit to open your eyes and your heart to what he might have you gain in this season that will prepare you for the next. Be a faithful steward of what God has placed in your hand and allow the God who sees you to continue to work and move in your life. Allow God to be faithful towards you, to go before you, to make a way for you as he made a way for David. When I think of someone who has been living this out, being faithful to what God has placed in her hand, I think about my friend Julie. Julie goes to our Hope City campus, and she's in a season of her life where she gets to stay at home with her kids. Julie has a passion to pour into the next generation, and she does that well through caring for her children. 
But she was in a season where she saw that passion and she, that she had in her hand and she wanted to continue to grow and continue to use it, continue pouring into folks. She didn't have the capacity to lead fully in students' ministry, but she knew that she had the capacity to mentor just one, <laughs> just one student. So she reached out to family ministries and she said, hey, I really like to mentor someone and pour into someone's life. And if there's one student that's in need, I would love to be that person for them. So she saw what was in her hand and she made herself available for what God would want her to do with what was in her hand. What would you have it that just a few weeks later, there was a girl who was new to our Hope City campus, and this young woman was courageous enough to step up and step out and say, hey, I'm looking for a mentor. Do you have anyone? And now these two are meeting regularly, and Julie is pouring into her life, and God has been working in Julie's life to prepare her to pour into the next generation. She was in a season of pouring into the next generation and simply asked God, to use what she could give, and it's making a big kingdom impact and a difference in our community as relationships are being built and young people are continued to being developed and mentored. So for David, the story goes on. He winds up using the gifts and abilities that he had been stewarding, pre preparing in the background to kill Goliath. David's story goes on and continues to be wild, right? He winds up being hunted by Saul, the current king, for four years. Saul eventually dies. David becomes king. He reunites Israel. And all's to say, David becomes a king and makes big moves and notable accomplishments. But before that, he was a side character. He did not have the main character energy for the lead role. But he was chosen by God. He was, and God was faithful towards David. And David was faithful to steward the opportunities that God had placed in front of him. As we've seen, David's story teaches us a few things about stewardship. And when I'm saying stewardship, I'm not just talking about finances. I'm not just talking about time. I think David, we can learn a thing or two about stewarding our whole lives. Remember this, that, that stewardship is this idea that we have a responsibility to use wisely all of the things that God has given us. In church, a lot of times when we talk about stewardship, we're talking about being good stewards of the triple T's, right? Time, talent, and treasure. And don't get me wrong, we need to learn to steward these things well. And we need to ask the Holy Spirit to teach us how to be good stewards in those areas. However, David's life encourages us and teaches us to be good stewards of not just a part of our life, but each season of our life, of our whole lives, to be stewards of the opportunities that God has placed in our lives and in our hands to remain faithful towards those seemingly small things that God places in front of us and to trust in God's faithfulness to come through on his plans and purposes in our life. Early on in David's life, at his anointing, we learn that, that even when people may forget or overlook us, God still sees us and has a plan for our lives. God will never leave us. He will never forget us. He's always working and always on the move in our lives and in our world, and he wants us to join him in that work. In the story of David and Goliath, we learn a couple more things about stewardship. We learn that our obedience to what God calls us to in the present makes a way for new things he is calling us towards in the future. Remember, the only reason that David was at the battlefield is because he was bringing lunch to his brothers. A seemingly small thing places David right where God wants him to be, to be able to do what God wants him to do. This reminds us that there are no small things, that nothing is wasted, that every moment can be given to God, every moment stewarded in obedience to him to have impact on our world. And we also learn that God prepares us for the things ahead through our faithfulness and stewardship to what he has in our hands in this season. David was, again, the already anointed king, but he was also a shepherd an unglamorous job, but God used that to prepare him for the next season of his life. 
And, and so my question to you today is this. What has God placed in your hand? What has God placed in your hand? What work, what friendship, what relationship, what opportunities, what skills, what abilities, what has God placed in your hand, in your life, in this season today? I, I encourage you this week to look at your life. Take an assessment of these areas, but don't stop there. Offer these things to God and ask him to do a work in your life. Ask him to help you steward these things well. Ask him what he wants you to do in this season and ask him how he might help you steward these things in your life for his plans and for his purposes, for your life and for our world. Let's pray. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you place us in different seasons in our lives. And we thank you that we have much to learn about you and our world and ourselves in each of those seasons. God, I ask that as we ask this week to reveal to us what's in our hands, that you would show us. Give us courage to offer the opportunities and abilities and gifts and seasons that you have placed in our hands back to you. God, we surrender them to you and we ask that you would use each season of our life for your purposes, for your plans, and for your glory that all the world would know you and know of your love. It's in your name we pray these things. Amen. Well, hey, thank you so much for joining us for Church Online. Like I said at the beginning, we have so many ways for you to get plugged in and connected at all of our campuses. We would love to see you at any of our weekend services or our events that we have going on this summer. So check out our webpage for those, and we'll see you again soon.